North of Seoul, where the Imjin River winds across the 38th parallel, a task force of British and Belgian troops boards the broad but shallow waterway in the first light of dawn as United Nations units roll steadily forward into the North Korean heartland during the week 16 to 23 April. Members of the 8th Hussars, a British tank unit, chow up beyond the Imjin before striking northward. Brigadier Brody, commander of the 29th British Brigade, plans the advance with one of his staff officers and an American artillery commander. The troops shoulder digging tools as well as rifles as they move up to repair roadbeds washed away by the week's rains. It's sloppy going underfoot as many of these British and Belgian troops newly arrived in Korea engage in their first major combat assignment. Mortar positions are prepared in a muddy field. Huge British Centurion tanks spearhead the task force, whose mission is to push northward as far as possible and prepare the roadways for a large-scale advance, which is planned for this area later in the week. Two known pockets of red resistance are bypassed during the day as the battalion strength patrol refuses to be diverted from its main task. Foot soldiers avoid the muddy roads as much as possible by piling aboard the broad backs of the British tanks. The bad weather not only hinders ground action, but cuts down on UN air support during the week's activities. The shoulders of a narrow road through a rice paddy are reinforced by slender tree trunks. The troops reach their farthest point of advance and take a break before returning to the Allied lines. North Korean natives come out of their homes to watch the task force. Expected enemy resistance does not materialize as the communists pull back in front of the patrol which probes eight miles above the parallel. Back at the Imjin River, a road leading to the fort is widened and improved in preparation for the full-scale advance by the British and Belgian units to take place during the next few days. As a result of the patrol's action, the main body of troops is later able to move across the river and occupy new positions above the parallel. As nightfall nears, the task force vehicles retrace their path and the patrol pulls back toward the UN lines. Northwest of Seoul, Task Force Roger organizes to cross the Imjin River. Tanks of a reconnaissance company and a heavy tank battalion move up to assemble with the men of a ranger company who are assigned to Task Force Roger. Clustered aboard the tanks are members of the recon company, ready for their mission of reconnoitering and clearing the Wangjin Mian area across the Imjin River. The rangers assemble in the road to start their march to the banks of the river. The lead tanks, already at the bank of the Imjin, head into the stream without any Chinese or North Korean resistance offered. As the armored vehicles inch from the shallow rapids near the shore to the middle of the river, they are slowed down considerably by the fender deep water. A scouting section of the reconnaissance company reaches a ridge that commands a view of the village of Ongnyan, but still there is no sign of enemy opposition. Other infantrymen edge along the ridge of a creek that cuts through the peaceful appearing Korean countryside. A section leader removes the brushwood covering a Chinese dugout, then methodically takes care of any possible inhabitants.
Task Force Roger continues as the tanks probe further into the Korean field several miles south of the 38th parallel. The men of the Ranger Company, unable to make contact with the enemy, retrace their steps over the Korean fields along the winding bridges formed by the contour farming. The tanks also about face for the return trip, carrying their topside passengers back for regrouping as the probing mission rings up a total of only one enemy met and killed. In the western sector, an artillery unit prepares to fire a night mission. A crewman primes an observation plane that is to perform aerial spotting for the artillery. These small liaison type aircraft have proved invaluable for directing artillery fire. Members of this artillery battalion leisurely enjoy chow. These artillerymen stand by waiting and making last minute preparations for our night mission. Orders? To fire on Chinese troops across the 38th parallel. Although spring floods slowed Allied transportation routes for many weeks, supply lines are now operating with full scale efficiency. 155 shells are unloaded at the battalion's position, visible proof of the huge buildup of supply for the massed firepower of UN artillery. As the day draws to a close, a crewman readies the weapon for firing. Nearby, an observation plane has crash landed on an improvised runway. Information on enemy positions has been gathered and is sent to the artillery section chief. The fire order is given and the big gun goes into action. On 23 April, Communist forces launched strong attacks along a 50-mile front in western and central Korea, preceded by an intensive artillery barrage. In the western sector, red attacks caused Allied forces to withdraw across the Imjin River near Korangpo and heavy fighting rages south of Chorwon. On the west central front, one red attack pierces the Allied line, forcing a withdrawal south of Kumwa and in the Hwachan Dam area. In the east, ROK troops engage an enemy battalion northeast of Inja, and a United Nations destroyer pours shells into enemy-held Kansong. Reports from the front indicate that the communist attacks are the beginning of the Reds' long-expected spring counteroffensive. The plane lands on a forward airstrip, bringing Lieutenant General James A. Van Fleet to inspect the 3rd Division sector. Major General Robert H. Soule, 3rd Division commander, greets the new 8th Army leader, who is accompanied by Lieutenant General Frank W. Milburn, 1st Corps commander. The inspection party is taken by jeep to the divisional CP located near the 65th Regimental Zone. At the CP, General Van Fleet, on one of his first forward inspection visits, greets divisional staff officers. Leaving the war tent, the 8th Army commander, who is also accompanied by Major General Levin C. Allen, his chief of staff, prepares for a tour of 3rd Division units. Like his predecessor, General Van Fleet carries a trademark, but instead of a grenade, he wears a pearl-handled automatic at his waist. Looking over his newly acquired command, the general leaves the 3rd Division headquarters area to inspect frontline positions.
The ever-changing battle scene in Korea demands constant reconnaissance to keep up to date on the situation. Officers of the G2 section of the 3rd Division confer with a photo sergeant before a map whose accuracy of detail has been greatly reduced because of shifting enemy positions. Careful notes of the terrain are made by the sergeant who has been assigned a photo recon mission. This Korean dwelling serves as office and operation point for the photo unit. From here, the cameraman starts on his mission. He uses a specially designed K-20 aerial camera on these reconnaissance assignments. A last minute inspection is made of the camera before taking off. The cameraman meets the pilot who will take him to the target and they move out to a waiting plane. A final discussion of the route and a check on the landmarks in the specified target area help to ensure success to both pilot and cameraman on their mutual assignment. Adjusting his parachute, the photographer squeezes into the tiny plane. The L-5 takes off. Over the target area, artillery action can be seen. A friendly plane below goes about its business. Farther on, an enemy-held village is being blasted with bombs and napalm. With their part of the photo mission accomplished, pilot and cameraman return to deliver the negatives. The L-5 flies low over the photo lab encampment, and the precious negatives are airdropped. The lab sergeant hurries the film to the darkroom for processing. The negatives are quickly developed and the roll is brought outside to dry. Windshield wiper serves as a handy and effective expedient in removing the excess water from the film. When dry, the roll of negatives is inspected, then returned to the lab for printing. Soon after, a lab man checks his work in the assembly line photo mission and finds the quality of the prints good. Back at the photo office, the cameraman receives the finished prints. He delivers the photographs to the G2 section. The successful outcome of many an engagement has resulted from this speeded up photo reconnaissance routine. Translated in terms of the battle situation, these photographs prepare commanders for what lies ahead, and they, in turn, are enabled to plan their actions against the enemy accordingly. On the obstacle course at Fort Lee, Virginia, quartermaster troops run a gauntlet of man-made hazards to toughen up for the rigorous task of testing the durability of Army clothing. In order to prove the lasting qualities of clothing items under the rough conditions met in the field, the quartermaster subjects the clothing to brutal tests under simulated field conditions. Men limber up on the obstacle course before donning the experimental uniforms and running wear and tear tests over one of the many arduous proving tracks maintained at Fort Lee. On the combat course, soldiers wearing front panels of material being developed by the quartermaster go through an assortment of devices designed to test resistance to abrasion. This is one good way to advance under fire. But how long issue garments will stand up under this sort of wear is what interests the quartermaster most. 
In addition to this testing course, special glove and shoe proving courses are also available at Fort Lee. After the uniforms have been taken for several trips over and under the various hazards, they are turned in for careful examination and checked for rips, torn seams, and general wear. Most of the combat course is traveled on the stomach under conditions simulating battle situations where stealthy and concealed movements are required. On the rain course, water pipes keep up a steady shower as the men model wet weather gear. The rain clothing is being tested not only for its wearing and waterproof qualities, but to find out if its bulk seriously restricts the movements of the soldier. By giving experimental clothing thoroughgoing trials under harsh conditions, the quartermaster makes sure that in the field, the items will last a reasonable length of time under the most adverse conditions. This testing work has far-reaching importance. Durable cloth means long life for the garments, less frequent replacement, and thus more shipping space for other needed battle equipment. After a strenuous walk in the rain, the men remove their wet weather clothing and turn it in for careful inspection. By 7 May, United Nations forces have retaken the initiative and are sending armored patrols slashing northward to search out withdrawing communist troops who last week were stopped cold north of the Han River by the massed power of UN ground, air, and naval units. In the west, UN tank patrols fight a skirmish northwest of Seoul and drive through Weijongbu without sighting the enemy. In the central sector, ROK units advance to the vicinity of Chunchan, where a red unit is routed. In the east, an Allied tank force is reported to have smashed above the parallel near Inje, and UN naval elements bombard Kansong. Although the much-heralded communist spring offensive is decisively hurled back short of its objectives, General Van Fleet warns his 8th Army troops that the Reds still have the power to reopen their drive at almost any point along the line. 